We're talking today with Bob Prince of Holland, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay. Now, Bob, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, the where and when were you born? I was born in Holland, Michigan, April 10 of 48. Went to Hamilton High School. Grew up on the south side of town. Oldest of seven kids. Okay. And what did your family do for a living? Uh, my dad actually worked in the old Holland Shoe Factory for till about 1962. And then he got a job as a plumber. Um, and my mother, after all of us kids were in school, my mother took a night job at Heinz just to bring in some extra cash. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And did you finish high school? I did. Graduated in 66 out of Hamilton. All right. And what did you do then? <laughs> yeah, then I was, I had a job all along, you know, from 12 years old, but I worked in a small motor shop that Dupree Electric ended up buying and didn't know where I wanted to go. Took some night classes, you know, to decide what I wanted to do. And then I got this letter from Uncle Sam, you know, report for your physical. And I thought, oh, shit. All right. This is not good. At we, the point when that happened, had you been paying much attention to what was going on with Vietnam and the draft and all that? I did. And I, in fact, uh, when I got my, my um, letter to report for my physical, I signed up for the National Guards. Of course, they didn't call me. You know, mm -hmm. I got drafted before they called. You know, my wife and I were engaged before all this happened and with a May 24th date of 68 for marriage. You know, so that was all, hey, what's going to happen, you know? Okay. So when did you have to report? I think it was March 13 or March 14th. Okay. And 68? 68. All right. I ended up, I think I took a bus out of Holland to Detroit or somewhere. Don't remember exactly. And then from there I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Okay. And did you do the physical in Detroit? Yes. Okay. Yep. And did you notice anybody trying to beat the system or talk about that? You know, it's such a long time I don't, oh, I don't remember. I know we all talked about Canada, mm -hmm. you know, but I didn't want to live with that the rest of my life either, you know, even though the president, one of our presidents pardoned us, you know, the guys that went. But, but you couldn't really know that in 1968. So. No, 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 I didn't want to disgrace my family or my country, so I, I just did what I was asked to do, you know. Okay. It wasn't a good time, but I, I did it, you know. All right. Now, uh, how seriously did they seem to take the physical itself? Do you remember anything about that? Nothing serious. You know, they, they checked your eyes and took x-rays, you know, to make sure your, your spine was good, of course. And if you were flat feet, you got out. And if you couldn't hear, you know, a lot of guys got a deferment for hearing or our next door neighbors got a deferment because he had flat feet. Mm -hmm. Went for his physical, physical, never went. All right. Same age as I, you know. But your feet were good, so off you go. Yeah, and off I went. Okay, so Fort Knox, Kentucky is your next stop? Mm -hmm. spent, okay. spent eight weeks in basic training there. All right. What kind of reception did you get when you arrived? At Fort Knox? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, we were nothing. You know, you, they have their way of training you. First, they have to break you down. You know, not as bad as the Marines, but still, they, they break you down. They, they call you your names. You know, they never touch me, but just, just a verbal abuse, you know. You know, just to make you tough and... Which it did, you know, make you tough and not have any emotions at all because they control everything, which I think was good when I went to Vietnam. Okay. What does the actual training consist of? There's a lot of physical training, uh, a lot of running, a lot of push ups, a lot of everything to build you up to make you strong. Uh, there was some, uh, we had, of course, we shot the M14 in, in uh, basic training, which we didn't use in Vietnam, you know, so you had training on the rifle range. Of course, I, I did well there. When they, when they tested me, I tested well in electronics, and I was thinking they wanted me to sign up for another year, and I said, I don't think I want to do that, because I had a high score in electronics, and I found out when I got to Nam that other guys had the same situation. They were carrying a radio with a 10-foot antenna. Okay. Yeah, that's what you got, you know? So I'm glad I didn't do it. Two years was enough. All right. So they had signed up for an extra year as well? Because they had a high score in electronics. Okay. And they were an RTO, a radio transmitter mm -hmm. operator. All right. Yeah. Were you in good shape when you went in? Yeah. I was uh, probably 145 pounds. You know, and back when you're 19, 20 years old, you're pretty much all muscle. And they even made more for you, you know, mm -hmm. with all the training. Okay. 
Okay. And what did they do to in instill discipline or try to train you to follow orders? If you didn't do what they said, you go down for 50 or down for 20 or whatever, you know, push-ups. Uh, or you have to run who knows what. But it was, if you didn't listen, you were disciplined. Not physically, but mentally. Okay. Well, physically, I guess, because you were doing push-ups. When you got there, did you have any idea what to expect? No. No, because I hadn't talked to anybody that had been there because, hey, I'm only 19 years old, you know. I turned 20 in uh, April April 60, 68, so that would have put me in, see, would I still be? Yeah, Probably I was still in Fort I, Knox. I think I was still in Fort Knox yet. Yeah. yeah. Now, how easy or hard was it for you to adjust to the Army way of doing things? <clears throat> well, being the oldest of seven, you kind of toe the line because you're expected to be better than the rest of them. I don't know where you are in your family, but you know, the younger you are in your family, the more leniency you have. You know, so I pretty much towed the line before I got drafted. So, it, you know, it wasn't hard for me, mm -hmm. but it was different. You know, you're away from your family, you know, and everything's different. And you're, everywhere you go, you run, you run, and then you stand in line. You know, and there's, uh, didn't seem like anybody cared, except the guys that are with you. You know, if you weren't feeling well or you were homesick or whatever, or you, whatever, you know, they, they kind of backed you up. Yeah, I went through that, you know, because we, we all went in at different times. We didn't all graduate at the same time. Okay, so, so you had people in, in your platoon or whatever who were, who had been there longer than you had or were recycled or? Some of them didn't make it and they had to go a second time. Okay. You know, the first, the first thing you did is shave your head. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the first thing. You know, and I had hair probably as long as, well, longer than I have now, probably as long as yours or more. Buzz it right off, you know. And the, and the, the barbers there smiled as they did it, you know. Okay. Did they ask you what style you wanted? For you? <laughs> yeah, they did. But you, everybody got the same haircut, you know. Yep. All right. Now, were the guys you were training with, were they all from Michigan or were they from other places? Everywhere. Um, there were a lot of people from Kentucky, Tennessee. Uh, there was a couple of guys from Michigan that I didn't know that mm -hmm. happened to be there at the same time. But I lost track of them when I went to Fort Polk. Sure. Because you know, they, they went a different direction, you know. Okay, so you have your eight weeks of basic, uh, and then did they tell you at that point what, what your specialization is going to be? Well, it kind of. I think uh, when you go to Fort Polk, you know where you're going. Yeah. They call that little Vietnam, and it was. It was hot and humid, you know, and rained a lot. You know, it was little Vietnam. Okay. Describe the actual training there. More of, more of the same as Fort Knox, but a little more intense. Um, I don't, I think we may have trained on an M16 there mm -hmm. in Fort Polk because we were gone there and we were going to use that. Right. We, did, we did some training on the M60 machine gun, which I carried or shared for eight or nine months with an assistant gunner. You know, so there was training on weapons, you know, and throwing grenades and setting up the Claymore mines, uh, little plastic explosive ones, you know, just that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you do kind of more extended field exercises now? We did. We did some overnight stuff. Uh, we ran carrying a gun with a backpack weighted down, you know, so you could realize, you know, even though we didn't run in Vietnam, uh, but it was good physical training. You know, so. Okay. And would they use, would they take you into swamps and things, or did you just stay on dry land? Yeah, we didn't go in swamps in Fort Polk. We had a, we had a party near a lake once. Uh, towards the end of our eight weeks, and uh, we were in a park, and it was by a lake, but there were alligators in the lake, mm -hmm. and some of what I call the rednecks that lived down there, they throw their stake bone on the launch ramp there with a rope around it, and they lasso an alligator. And I'm standing there in awe and saying, hey, I wouldn't be doing that, not for where I'm, from where I'm from, you know? <laughs> right. Okay. Now, what sort of people were training you there? They were what I call lifers. I think some of them had probably been to Nam. Mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, sergeants, you know, either a, a Sergeant um, E5 or an E6 with a rocker on the right. bottom. Uh, there were some black guys, some white, some, yeah, there wasn't any, not too many Hispanics. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think we had one in Nam, one or two in our unit. But yeah. Did they also have sort of more junior non-coms who were kind of learning how to do it? That would be assigned to you as well, the shake and bake types? That, I think they were separate, but they came to Nam thinking, you know, hey, I've got all this rank, you know, I've got all this head knowledge, I went another 13 weeks longer than you in training, you know, and I'm going to come here and run your squad or your platoon. And they found out very quickly that they had to prove themselves before they got that job, because mm -hmm. it was someone that was probably a spec four that was a squad leader, a platoon leader, or whatever, you know, and they didn't get the job right away because they had to prove that they knew what, you know, head knowledge or book education doesn't teach you like it really is. Sure. You know, to live it or to live it that someone, you know, someone else has taught you, it's a lot different to learn right from someone that's been there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, how long did the uh, advanced training last? Another eight weeks. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then what happens once that's complete? Then I had a one month leave and went to Nam. Okay. Uh, what was it like to go home again knowing you're going to go to Vietnam? Well, I'll back up a little bit. You know, I'd, like I said, uh, we had a wedding date of May mm -hmm. 24th, right. which put me in Fort Polk, Louisiana. When I got there, I asked the captain, you know, hey, I've got this wedding coming. It's been planned for almost a year. Can I have a weekend off to go home? The answer was always no. No. You need this training. You can't. So my wife. My wife's boss was friends with one of the state reps in Michigan, and he called down to Fort Polk, and I went home for a weekend. Got home in time for the rehearsal dinner on Thursday. Went back on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. And then I finished my, base, my advanced training, came home for 30 days, and off to Nam. And we were both in, you know, my wife was pregnant. You know, I don't know where I'm going even when I'm there. Am I even going to come back alive, you know? Uh, it was, I, I don't know that I shed tears. I know my wife was, but, you know, like I've told other people, they taught us to be tough and not show emotions. And, you know, when you're 20 years old, you don't, you don't let people see you cry. Mm -hmm. You don't cry, you know. But I didn't like the idea. Well, it's it was still a, a lot for a 20-year-old to deal with. <laughs> yep. All right. Yep. So how now do they get you out to Vietnam? Well, you jump. Uh, I probably had to drive to Grand Rapids, catch a plane, and then meet at a certain area, and then we kind of congregate on the west coast, California. I don't remember exactly where. Until you could fill a plane, then you fly over. Yeah. San Francisco was the main place. So there's a big depot in Oakland a lot of guys. Yeah, I think to. so. And I remember coming back from Nam, we drove. The taxi took us and we drove past, what, Alcatraz out in the water? Mm -hmm. I remember that. So where we were, I don't know. We might have been in Oakland and went north to San Francisco mm -hmm. to catch a flight. All but right. Now, the plane itself, was that a chartered commercial plane? or was Yeah, okay. yeah just a, like you'd take to Florida, all right. except it was all guys in green uniforms, you know. And do you remember stopping any place on the way over? We stopped in, um, I want to say Guam to refuel. Okay. Went past Hawaii, stopped in Guam. At that time, my high school friend was stationed in Guam in the Navy, but I didn't have time to go see him because mm -hmm. they just refueled and were gone again, you know? Okay. And then where did you land in Vietnam? Tonsonut uh, Air Base. And uh, I still remember that we're coming in and we kept circling. Everybody's asking, why are we circling? And I said, well, there's a sniper on the edge of the runway and they're shooting at us. Uh, holy shit, here we are. We're not even on the ground and I'm getting shot at already. You know, so that was an eye opener. And then I step off the plane and it's like stepping into a, into a sauna. So hot and humid you could hardly breathe. Broke out into an instant sweat. And that's pretty much the way I was for a year. Did you come in during the day or at night? During the day. Okay. And what did you do once you get off the plane? They... Uh, like always, you run and stand in line, and they check you in, and then they, they, they give you this week of intensive training, and a lot of it's at night. You're crawling, you're crawling through a simulated jungle, you know, and there's trip wires and everything else, and you trip the wire, it doesn't explode, a light goes on and lets you know you screwed up, but uh, those guys that were training us were guys that had lifted, lived it. They were there, and they, they were training us to, to do 
what they knew. Now, you know? did you do that training down uh, around Saigon, or was that after you were sent to your division? I, th I think it was in, I'm not sure where Tonsonut Airport was. I don't know it's if outside that, of Saigon. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Cause there, must, the there, there must have been a base there somewhere. Yeah. Well, there are big bases around. There's Long Ben, Benoit, which people sometimes stayed at. Yeah. Uh, but the 101st Airborne also had its own training school. They probably had it there. Uh, and that was about a week long, because I've talked to a lot of guys who were in that unit. Yeah. So that may have been there. Sometimes, though, there was a Vietnam orientation of some kind for the new guys coming in. It, uh, but anyway, so that's just kind of run together yeah, in your mind. It, you know yeah. you got training before you went out to your unit. And I don't remember if I was assigned before they put me through the training. Mm -hmm. I remember being assigned, and they said, you're going up to Wei, Fubai. Right. You know, and I thought, oh, shit. That's where the DMZ is. That's where they come from, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so you another, may have been assigned to the 101st at that point, but maybe didn't have a specific unit assignment yet. I don't recall. You know, it's, it's, it's in here, but it doesn't want to come out. Okay. Talk a little bit more about the, that, that week of training. What combination of stuff did you get there? It, it was everything. I don't remember if it was any more physical training, but it was all about Vietnam. Everything that you would encounter in Vietnam, from booby traps to landmines to... Um, and it was, a lot of it was night training. You, know, you were crawling through places you couldn't see, it was pitch black. Uh, and it was just really intense from what I remember of what I learned at Stateside at all. Mm -hmm. Stateside was just basic and advanced training. Here it was, this is what you got to know to stay alive. All right. Uh, now, during that period when you're doing that, that training there, um, did the base get attacked in any way? I mean, the it's always at night. You know, we're in a sleeping on a cot in a in a barracks. It's just got a tin roof with sandbags around it, probably waist high. If if the mortar hit the tin roof, you're toast. Mm -hmm. There was really nothing on the roof. I remember that all night long. You hear mortars landing or gunfire. Well, like Chicago, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, and when that happened, did you go into a bunker or did you just stay there and wait? Oh, well, we just kind of hit the floor, you know, get as close to the standbags as you could. But it, uh, it was, I didn't, I didn't sleep very well. In fact, I didn't sleep very well the whole year I was there. You know, you're always on edge. You know, you don't know when it's going, when it's going to happen, you know. When that guy you talked to yesterday is going to shoot you from the woods, you know, or from the jungle as you walk by, you don't know. All right, uh, so what unit do they assign you to? It was C Company of the 1st to the 321st Battalion and 327th. We were in the 3rd third platoon. I don't recall what squad it was, yeah. but... Those will kind of come and go. Uh, All right, now what, did you join the unit in a base or out in the field or...? We, did, we went to the base camp and um, I don't know, it was somewhere between Wei and Fubai. They're pretty mm -hmm. close together there. And it was a base camp. Um, and it was the same thing, a barracks that the CBs who were ever built, you know, with a tin roof, uh, you know, was open, it had shutters that flipped down with screens on it, sandbags halfway up the wall, you know, almost waist high. I've got pictures of guys that were sitting on the sandbags, but uh, same thing. And, they had, and I think there was a separate building that was an office where they checked you in and, and um, gave you the equipment you needed. Okay. I, now, I, what kind of reception did you get when you <coughs> joined your platoon? Well, the, the common word for uh, somebody just coming into the country was cherry. Because mm -hmm. you were, I don't know exactly what it was, but cherry it meant that you were, you got a long time to go. You know, you're new in the country, you don't know okay. shit. You, you were know? a virgin in terms of combat. There you go. <laughs> That's a good way to put it, virgin. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, some of the, I, I can still remember back in the base camp yet, one of these old sergeants, I don't know if he was an E5 or an E6, but he's talking about what he did out there, and he, at the same time he's shaving dry with a, with a Bic razor just to show you how tough he is, and he's probably on his third tour. Mm -hmm. he's, got no, he's got no family back home, he doesn't have any life, so he's armies his life. Mm -hmm. And he's telling you what he knows and trying to scare you before you even get out there, you know? All right, and then... How long did you stay in the base camp before you went out? Probably just overnight. Okay. And then when you first go out in the field, what are you doing? 
Well, it depends where we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we might have been in the base camp a couple, three days because the resupplies were only six days. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I came in halfway, I might have been there three days until right. the next resupply, and I jump on a chopper with the resupplies and fly out to where they are. Okay. You know, whether we're in the mountains or in the jungles or in the rice paddies, you know, they, they have a, they either find an LZ, a landing zone that's cleared, or they have to make one. Okay. But do you remember if, so you, did you actually have to fly out into the field to join them that way? Right. Or, okay. Yeah. So yep. they're already out there. So, already so out back there. at the base camp, you've got this, the, whoever is in the rear is, is talking to you when you're, you're seeing this, but yep. then yep. You, you, you take the helicopter out and join them out in the field. Yep. Yep. And, and do you remember what kind of terrain they were in when you joined them? I, I think we were in the mountains at that time. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that they cleared the LZ. It was probably one that someone else had did in the past, you know, and they just got to find it, you know, for resupply. Mm -hmm. You know, and they just, uh, if it's a hot LZ, they'll, at times, well, not not when I went out in the field. It was it was a it was a not a hot LZ. You know, nobody was shooting at us. But other times, when we were getting resupplied or called in a medevac, you know, there was a hot LZ, and the, we'd call in Cobras or whatever to strafe the area because mm -hmm. they were trying to knock the knock the chopper out of the air before it got on the ground. You know. So. Okay. So then you kind of go out and you join the unit. Uh, than in the field, does anybody kind of make an effort to show you around or does someone just say shut up and follow me or what happens? I think it was pretty much, you know, we, we slept on the ground. There was, no, there was no building for us to be in, you know, right. we slept on the ground. You know, everything we carried was on our back. We slept on the ground. We didn't have an air mattress or anything, just a piece of plastic between us and the ground. <coughs> and uh, most of it you learned as you went. You know, they'd say, okay, uh, and we're, so, so we're walking on a trail, you know, or whatever, and, you know, stay about, stay about 15 feet apart, you know, and, and uh, of course, I'm new in the country, and I'm, I see gooks everywhere. I'm looking everywhere in the brush to see if it's moving or not, you know. I didn't know any better. You know, that was, I was afraid. I'm sure, that, I'm sure everybody new in country was afraid. In fact, a lot of times we were afraid there. We didn't show it. You know, like I told other people, I said, we lived in fear, powered by adrenaline, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, um, and we weren't always afraid, but you never know. You never know when your time's up. Mm -hmm. Now, you're out there, this is sort of kind of late summer of 68, I guess you get to Vietnam in August, so you're going to be August, September, so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, did you have much contact with the enemy? We always had... They always had the element of surprise on us, but we always had them outnumbered. And like I said earlier, uh, I was fortunate I didn't have to go to the Asia Valley. That's where it was really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally, they'd have the element of surprise and they'd get off a few rounds and maybe wound someone. But in the end, we won. But uh, we never knew when it was going to happen. Did you have kind of a standard procedure? I mean, if, if shots break out or they try to ambush you or snipe at you. What did you do when that happened? You hit the ground. Okay. Try to figure out where it's coming from and let loose with everything you got, you know? Yeah. And most of the time, you know, it, there may have been times that happened during the day, but <laughs> <laughs> most of what I remember was at night. And would you be moving at night or would you be camped no. somewhere? No. A couple times we were moving at night. We were setting up an ambush out of a village and, and, no. Uh, and they, they were coming in to steal from the Vietnamese, the VC were, and, and they'd, there'd be someone in plays, plain clothes walking in, and was, it might have been the kid that we were talking to during the day when we were in the village. At night, he's point man coming in for the VC, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden he ducks out of sight, and it's just before dark, and then the shit hits the fan, you know. All of a sudden, there's rounds coming at us, and RPGs, and, and we're to returning fire. Now, how often were you in areas that had a civilian population? Well, it'd be the, if we were working in the villages or guarding bridges, you know, they were on Highway 1. Mm -hmm. They were near a village, most of the bridges where there was a river. Um, fire bases, there were no civilians there. Out in the jungle, you didn't run into any of the civilians because it was not a city. You were just out there trying to right. find them, you know. Right. 
So you basically kind of went back and forth to a certain extent between the coastal area where you still had some civilians and people around yeah. and then the jungle areas and stuff yeah. farther inland where they weren't. Yeah, and once in a while we'd get get to go back to the base camp for a stand down, they'd call it. You'd come mm -hmm. in during the day and spend a night and and then go back out the next day. Okay. Uh, now, did your company normally operate in, in separate platoons or squads, or how did they work? I think it was platoons, but we were pretty much in the same area mm -hmm. in case we needed help. Right. You know, we weren't, you know, 60 people walking down a trail. You know, they were probably over, you know, two or three clicks to the east or west or whatever, and, but they were in the same area. We knew where they were. Okay. And they knew where we were. And what do you think the average so strength of your platoon was when you were in the field? Well, there would be three or four squads of probably five or six guys, so 24, mm -hmm. somewhere between 24 and yeah. 30. So the whole company would be less than 100 probably? Yeah, there would be three, probably three platoons, mm -hmm. about 75. You know, and it, and it varied because someone got wounded, they went back, or someone mm -hmm. got killed, they went back. Well, then we're short two or three or how many guys until someone is comes in to replace them. And so there were times we were running lighter than that, and there were times we had more. Okay. Now, did you get a regular assignment within your uh, squad? Um, yeah, if I wasn't carrying the machine gun, I had an M16. Mm -hmm. I, I never ran, I never walked point. Um, like I told other people, I said I, I did what my country asked, but I wasn't going to be a hero. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got a wife and child back home, okay. I didn't volunteer to go out on on patrols during the day, unless they said, hey, Pringe, you're gone, then I'd go, but otherwise, I didn't go. Okay. And now, did you get assigned fairly early as an assistant machine gunner, or you just wind up carrying the gun yourself, or? Well, you know, you got a, a gunner and an assistant gunner, mm -hmm. and um, I don't recall if, if the gunner went home, because he had his time up or what, but um, they just asked for volunteers, and not too many p people volunteered. And we had a lot of black guys or Afri African Americans or whatever you want to call them, you know, and they were all, they all had bad backs, they didn't want to carry the gun. Mm -hmm. So I don't recall any, any black guy ever carrying a gun. You know, it was up to us. Now, did you in the end volunteer or did someone just point to you and volunteer you? Yeah, I, I vol I pro I'm sure I volunteered to carry the gun. Mm -hmm. They didn't say, hey, Prince, you're going to do it. Okay. Um, I think I volunteered, and the guy that was um, Kenny Chance, that him and I shared the gun for about nine months, and, you know, and he went home in July because he came in before I did, or June. You know, so him and I bunked together, and we pretty much shared the machine gun for eight, eight or nine months. So he may have taken over the gunner's spot from the guy that went home. Mm -hmm. But between you, you kind of went back and forth in terms of who actually carried the gun. Right. All right. Uh, and what was your... When you're out in the field for, you know, six days or whatever, what, what kind of pack did you carry? I had a, what we called a rucksack, and, and um, I totaled up the numbers of what I carried because I spoke at the high school before Veterans Day. <clears throat> and um, we had a six-day resupply of sea rations, which is 10, 12 pounds. I carried eight quarts of water because I sweated a lot and drank a lot. That's 16 pounds. Uh, I had a large ammo can that all my personal stuff was in that I didn't want to get wet. You know, by the time you fill that up, it's another 10 pounds or more. And if I was carrying the gun, that was 25, plus 100 rounds on it at 7, plus another two or 300 on your back at 7 100. I totaled up and I was carrying more than 100 pounds mm -hmm. when I carried the gun. You know, and how much do you think you weighed at that point? 145. Mm -hmm. You know, so training back stateside helped us survive. Whenever you sit down on the trail, you'd have to sit on a little incline like that, otherwise you'd never get back up. Mm -hmm. You just kind of plop down and you got your backpack, your rucksack holding you there, and sometimes you need somebody else to pull you up because you couldn't get up. All uh, right, now when you're out in the field, uh, what would you do at night? We'd, we'd, pick a, we'd find a spot to set up a, a, a base camp during the night or whatever you want to call it, be in a circle, hopefully on the top of a hill or a mountain. And uh, we just set up a perimeter, <clears throat> clear a spot for us to sleep. And if the weather was uh, the monsoons, you know, we'd snap together a couple of ponchos and make a tent out of it to stay dry, sleep on the ground, try to dig a trench around it so the water would run around you instead of through where you were sleeping. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, we slept on a piece of plastic. We had a poncho liner, a camouflage one that we covered up with, slept in our clothes with our boots on, same clothes for six days. All right. Uh, now, when you're out in the field, would they resupply you if they could? Every six days they did. Okay. Yeah. That, you know, and then so your mail came in, your mail went out, you got water, you got to change your clothes. Sometimes you would have two pairs of socks. One time, most of the time, just one pair of socks. They give us a box of old D underwear. We didn't wear them because you, your crotch would always stay so wet and you'd get crotch rot, you know? Mm -hmm. Jungle jungle rot or whatever you want to call it. So we didn't wear underwear. All right. Uh, and how would you, what, what kind of leadership did you have, the sergeants, lieutenants, uh, company commanders? Uh, what did you think of them? The captain we didn't see much of because mm -hmm. I don't know where he was, but he didn't run with us. Okay. So we had a lieutenant, either a first or second lieutenant as our platoon leader. Right. And then the guys that were in country longer were a squad leader. Mm -hmm. You know, I never was a squad leader because there was always somebody with more, more rank than me or more experience. And you're normally not a squad leader and a machine gunner at the same time. Right. You know, so all in all, we were all in the same boat. You know, we we're, were like brothers. And these seven of us, they get together once a year. And we're still like brothers. We call each other brothers, you know. I, I'll tell them things or I can talk to them easier than I can my two brothers. Because we, we watched each other's backside for a year. Right. You know, anything that was going wrong at home or Dear John letters or... You know, um, when I was there, I was in country a month. I went and our, our first son was born September 9th. I went into country uh, August 13 or 14, and it was six weeks before I knew I was a father because mm -hmm. my mail hadn't caught me. My mail's gone out, and, and I'm talking about things that are happening, and, and they're wondering why I'm not responding about the, being a father, and all of a sudden I got a stack of mail this big full of pictures. My mother still is pissed at the Red Cross to this day because they couldn't find me. Mm -hmm. She didn't know whether I was dead or alive. She called them and gave them what for, you know, and they, you know, communications back then were terrible. Right. Now, there weren't any cell phones or satellite phones. You had that radio on your back with a 10-foot antenna, and you didn't talk about stuff like that, you know? Right. You know, so. All right. Uh, to, <clears throat> now, you mentioned earlier that um, you would get some of these uh, newly minted sergeants who would come out, people who had got extended training but had no field experience. They go out in the field. Um, now, did these guys always act like they knew what they were doing, or did some of them try to follow your lead first, or how did it work? Uh, the arrogant ones didn't follow your lead. Mm -hmm. It took them a while. It took the guys a while to break them down to understand that, hey, you're not going to be the leader until you can prove yourself. Just because you got a lot of schooling back home, it doesn't mean you know what's happening here, you know? So how would you deal with a guy like that, or how would the squad deal with somebody like that? They just kept telling him, hey, you're not in charge. <laughs> Show us that you know what's going on, then you're, then you're in charge, you know? Some of them were arrogant, some of them understood, mm -hmm. you know? After a while, they all, and you know, once they got there for a month or two, they realized what we were talking about, and they do the same thing to the, someone coming in to replace me. Right. You know, so... It, it, it was kind of a chain of command, and, and once you're in it, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't come there knowing everything, you know. And do you remember how many platoon leaders you went through? Well, we had, we had uh, Lieutenant Frick that was killed. His daughter flies in from California and comes to our reunions mm -hmm. every year. Uh, she never knew her dad. Uh, when, her, when, her, when her mother got word that her dad died, her mother went, went off and just went off the deep end, and mm -hmm. so her grandmother raised her. Um, he, for one, was killed. Um, you know, and they just rotate in like we did. Right. You know, if they weren't wounded, they'd be there for a year, you know, and they might, if they came in October, they'd be there past the time I went home. Okay. Because most of the time in Vietnam, at least for the line units, <clears throat> they would rotate officers every six months could be rather than that so yeah, I, had, I don't I don't recall how long that. did you uh, have uh, lieutenant Frick you know the other guys would know when he was okay. killed um, I don't think he made it six months mm -hmm. and he was gone and so if he, he was, so if he would have been rotated to something else he was killed before he was rotated right 
And then the fellow who replaced him, did he stay the rest of the time? or? Do you I, know I think so, but I don't recall who, who, who replaced him. Okay. You know, this is all back here, and the, for 35 years I suppressed it, you know, and now I'm trying to get it out. You sure. Know? So the people who really make the impression with you are really the guys in your own squad and the ones that you know, you know right. the best. Yep. Okay. Uh, now, what kind of casualties did your unit take over the course of the year? Well, in the Ishaw Valley, we took casualties, but I wasn't there because I had abscessed teeth and I was in the rear, you know, healing and getting teeth pulled. So I don't recall how many were killed or wounded in action there, but that was the worst place that I didn't have to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I told you earlier, I said, by the grace of God and lots of prayers back home, I wasn't in the Ishaw Valley. Mm -hmm. but it did you get into any uh, more extended firefights? I mean, you have these very short things that you mentioned. Not really where I was in the Ishaw Valley. I'm, I'm sure it was intense. Mm -hmm. In fact, there, um, I was reading a, something, a documentary or somewhere. One of the units of the 101st were pretty much totally wiped out. Mm -hmm. They were walking down a trail and the NVA or the VC were on both sides and they were walking through a valley with the hills on both sides and the they were totally annihilated. Mm -hmm. A whole platoon or company just wiped out. You know, I didn't. I didn't have any of that. It was all, like I said, small groups that uh, smaller than us, but we had them outnumbered. But they had. They knew. They knew where we were, and we didn't know where they were. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about what things were like when you were in the more built-up areas, like guarding bridges and things like that. What kind of daily routine did you have then? It was pretty laid back. Um, We'd have our turn walking the bridge, you know, two hour shifts or whatever. Two or, two or three of us walking the bridge and then you're just laying back trying to stay out of the sun in the bunker, you know, and writing a letter back home or whatever, you know. That was pretty easy duty, along with fire bases. Okay. Now when you're on the bridge, I mean, what kind of traffic would be going back and forth? It was a one-way bridge okay. and it was the old cars of the 60s you saw. Older cars than what we have here in the 60s. Mm -hmm. All black. Fenders flapping, overloaded with everything, you know, people everywhere. Buses, you know, with everything on top, people hanging out. And was it your job to try to check people, or were there MPs who did that? I think the MPs did that. You know, and I can remember many times on that, we were probably there for three weeks or a month, you know, on that bridge, and every time we'd, the Vietnamese kids would be there on the bridge, because every time we threw a grenade in the water, it would kill a bunch of fish. So they're diving off the bridge, many in their hand as they could carry, you know, and they're swimming back to shore with, with free fish, you know. Uh, I thought that was really funny. And, and, and we interacted more with the people when we were in that area. Right. Like in the villages, you know, if we, when we were, when we were working uh, ambushes out of the villages, we'd sleep in a, a Buddhist kabota or some abandoned building to, during the night, or during the day, I mean, we'd try to sleep during the day because we didn't sleep much at night, you know, and, so the people would come and we'd talk to them. And uh, more than once, uh, when the shit hit the fan the next, that night or the next night or whatever, some of those people that we talked to during the day were some of the people that were dead the next morning. Mm -hmm. Here they were scoping us out. We didn't even know. Like a lot of the wars now, you know, you don't, you don't know who the enemy is. Second World War you did, mm -hmm. unless the Germans got a, a, a U.S. uniform and put it on. They could speak English, but... We never knew who the enemy was. There was no front lines. The fighting was everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, what sort of, beyond that, what kind of impression did you form of the Vietnamese people? <laughs> uh, it's hard to say. I remember when the war was over, our church sponsored a Vietnamese family and me being a plumber, the place they rented needed some plumbing done, mm -hmm. so I went over there and donated my plumbing, which the landlord got free, you know, because mm -hmm. they were renting the place. We gave them our bed, bought a new bed, but I'm sure they probably slept on the floor. Uh, uh, you, you know, you wonder, you know, even though they probably weren't part of it, you still associate them with the bad people. Mm -hmm. Just like in today, you know, with, with what's going on yeah. with ISIS. Mm -hmm. We kind of say all Muslims are bad, you know, and 
I've kind of gotten over it. You know, I don't, I don't say thing, bad things about Asian people. There were, there were some Asian kids in the class that I spoke in at Hamilton High. You know, and uh, they were, in fact, one of them, not in the class I spoke, one of the other, one of the other vets spoke in a class, and there was an Asian girl in there, and he asked her where she was from. She said, Ho Chi Minh City. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, great. But, you know, she's two or three generations removed from sure. that, you know? Yeah. The, so basically, while you were there, you were kind of conditioned as almost a survival thing. You had to be suspicious because and you saw what could happen. Uh, yeah. Now, when you were surrounded with civilians, uh, was there, there trouble you could get into? Women, drugs, things like that? You could, but I was married, mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to do that, and I didn't do it. There were guys that did that were married. Uh, one of the guys I remember, we were... When, when we were guarding the bridge, uh, the day he found, got word that his wife had a baby, he bought a hooker for anybody that wanted it. And I wanted to say something, but I kept my mouth shut. Mm -hmm. I was like, what kind of husband are you, you know? Okay. Uh, now, there's a lot of stereotypes about Vietnam, and one of them has to do with, with drug use. I mean, did you notice much of that, either in the rear or the field? I will say I smoked marijuana three times, but never inhaled it, <laughs> like one of our presidents. Yes. No, I did. I did. And in fact, we were pulling perimeter guard on a fire base, and I walked two bunkers over, and the guys were in there smoking a joint, and the air was blue, and I took two or three hits off, and I thought, whoa. I went back to my bunker because I was hungry, mm -hmm. and like half speed, everything slow motion. I didn't think I was ever going to get to my bunker. I think I smoked marijuana three times while I was there, and I said, if I keep doing this, I'm going home in a black bag with a zipper on it. Mm -hmm. And there were <clears throat> guys, mostly black guys, most of the ones that would have been in jail or the Army that were in our unit, and if we were out in the boonies or wherever we were, you know, and set up our perimeter, and it was my turn to pass off the guard watch to those guys I knew was high, I didn't go to sleep because mm -hmm. they didn't care. I guess they figured if they were killed high, it wouldn't hurt so much, you know? Okay. So some of them would actually uh, smoke it in the field? They had friends back in the rear that on, on a resupply, they'd hide it in the resupply and they'd get a nickel bag, as we called it back then. Mm -hmm. Nickel bag for five bucks and they'd have, they'd have all the marijuana they wanted. And they'd sit in their little circle and we'd, we'd set up base, base camp and they'd sit in their little circle and get high. Did anybody make any effort to kind of change that or make them be a little more alert? Um, you know, I don't recall, but I've read books about, about the, the black people in their own little clique, you know, mm -hmm. and you didn't confront them because you get in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. not, not as, I don't know that you'd be called racist like you would nowadays, but you just let it go. You just realize that they weren't part of what, weren't part of saving your backside. Because there were a fair number of units, and even later than this, where at least in the field there was a fair amount of discipline and they wouldn't do it because they realized it was dangerous and they might do it in the rear. But there are also cases where they do it in the field. That's why we ask the question, because it varies a lot. Sure. depends on what unit you're with and when you're with them for, for what the, the practice is. Yep. So was there a fairly high proportion of black soldiers in your platoon? You know, I, I don't recall, but there's probably five or six, okay. maybe seven. You might have one or two in your squad, mm -hmm. maybe none. You know, we had a couple of Hispanic guys. Um, they were good. You know, I'd, I'd trust them on my backside. Mm -hmm. Like I told other people, I said there was, in the whole time in, my, in the Army, in, in Nam, I said there was only one guy that was black that I'd trust my backside with, and I think he was gay. Mm -hmm. You know, and the rest of them, I didn't sleep. I'd hand that watch off and I'd stay awake. Mm -hmm. You hear too many stories of uh, that outpost doesn't report in in the morning. Somebody goes out to check and they're all dead. They got their throat slit because somebody fell asleep. I didn't want that to happen to me. Mm -hmm. I was going to do everything I could to come back alive. Okay. Now, when you were out in the field, would you put out listening posts or things like that, or would you just stay together in one perimeter? It was it was kind of a perimeter, and you know, and, and um, I don't recall having a listening post out farther. You know, our perimeter was set up probably bigger than this room. Mm -hmm. You know, in kind of a circle, as much of a circle as you could get, you know, and you're sitting there pitch black. You know, if there's no moon or it's cloudy, it's pitch black. 
you're staring at something you swear it's moving. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and uh, you're about ready to cut loose on it. And, and you wake up the guy next to you and said, do you see that moving there? Is that moving? Should, should I let loose on it? And we'd both blink our eyes and keep looking at it. I don't know what it is. It doesn't seem like it's moving. But, you, you know, it, it's pitch black. and You can't, you, know, you, you could probably see about this far in front of you. And it's just, mm -hmm. if the stars are shining, you see a little farther than that. And uh, many times I was about ready. In fact, uh, one of the guys had that happen. Turned out it was a water buffalo. We were in the villages, and he shot a water buffalo, mm -hmm. which we had to pay for, or he right. had to pay for, hundred bucks. Shot a water buffalo. You pay hundred bucks for it. He thought it was a VC coming at us in the dark. And I don't know why the water buffalo was moving at night, but uh, he didn't live. Okay. Did you uh, encounter other kinds of, of wildlife? Did you have rats or snakes or <laughs> other things like that? Uh, never saw any rats, never saw any monkeys or tigers. We weren't in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of leeches. Um, we were up on a fire base. Don't know where it was. Uh, we went up there to abandon the base. They were hauling artillery off mm -hmm. of it. And it was our job to be the last ones off that base. And it was way up in the mountains and the monsoons came in. And we were in the clouds. And it was raining. And they couldn't get to us. We were down to eating the stuff we didn't like in the sea rations, and there wasn't much of that, you know? And you'd be sitting there under your little hooch you made with your friend, dig a trench around you, and the water's still running through because it was raining so hard. There'd be earthworms that big around, two, three feet long, crawling by you. Centipedes with, must have been more than 100 legs, the same length. I thought, mm -hmm. whoa, where did those come from? They didn't even want to be in the ground because it was so wet. Mm -hmm. we, had, we had joked about eating them, you know? But uh, never did. Back in the, um, we guarded the bridges and the bunkers. We didn't have too much trouble with it on the fire bases, but I remember being in that bunker, you know, and at night you'd want to sleep inside the bunker. And as soon as the lights go out, you know, they have a generator and they shut it off and everything's pitch black. There's no lights at all at night. No city lights, you know, those people didn't have electricity. So you go in the bunker and the lights go out and all of a sudden you hear the whole thing crawling. There were roaches two, three inches long living under the skids. We had wood skids that we slept on mm -hmm. with cardboard on them. So we slept on the bunker, on top of the bunker, and took our chances with incoming. We didn't want to sleep in there with the roaches, you know. But uh, that's about all I saw. I didn't, didn't see any, okay. anything I'd be afraid of other than leeches. All right. Now, at the time you had to leave the field for, because of the, the abscess tooth, you talk about kind of what happened to you and how you wound up being sent to the rear and then what they did with you. Um, I did everything. KP, I had hot, I had hot meals for that month mm -hmm. that I didn't cook, you know, and I'd have to, I'd have to take my turn doing P, P, KP and another one with shit detail. And uh, my grandkids don't believe that, that Got a 55-gallon drum in half, slip it under the latrine, and when it gets about that full, you pour a bunch of diesel fuel on it and light it, and you got to stir it as mm -hmm. it burns, black smoke. Yeah. Where did they send you for the dental work? <laughs> right on base. So just on base. Yeah. So they I think you were at Camp Evans or Camp Eagle or Camp Eagle. Okay. Yeah. And they had a, they had a, I, I think the dentist was right there. I don't recall. Yeah, probably. I mean, they had because there was kinds a, of medical facilities there. Yeah, and. Uh, Camp Eagle and Camp Evans were quite close together, right. so I might have went to Camp uh, Evans where there was a dentist. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember. Because Camp Eagle was divisional camp, and Evans was often a brigade-sized camp, so that mm -hmm. Evans would have been the, Eagle would have been most likely for something like that. But right. who knows? Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, did you get an R and R while you were in Vietnam? Went to Hawaii. Um, my wife came from home, and like I told the kids at Hamilton, I said, you know what? I came from hell on earth to paradise, spent six days with my new wife, and had to turn around and go back to hell, not knowing if I was going to ever see her alive again or even see my son. He didn't come with. It was mm -hmm. just for the two of us had six days. Right. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember if I had tears running down my face when I left. I know, she, I know Nancy was crying when I left, because uh, I left before she did. She came with another... Uh, wife from Zealand mm -hmm. um, got to know her quite well riding on the plane both ways. We didn't see him at all while we were there, but um, 
That was one time I thought about AWOL, but I thought, where am I going to go? You're on an island, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's going to follow you the rest of your life. <laughs> so I, I didn't do it. How far were you into your tour when you went to Hawaii? About halfway. It was March. All right. Yeah. Now, did you get, aside from the stand downs on the base, did you get to go in any place else, either in Vietnam or outside of it? I had a, a three day, I forget what they called it, and you could go to Singapore or somewhere else, and I thought, no, I'm gonna, not going to go there because I'm going to get in trouble. So I just stayed in the base camp, mm -hmm. you know, and did whatever I had to do there, just, just so I was, you know, even though it was, you know, there were mortar rounds coming in and fire at night, at, even in the base camp. You know, so I felt a little safer there than I did out in the field, so I thought, you know, I got three days, I'm going to take it. Okay. And one other time we went to, uh, uh, I think it was called Cameron Bay. Mm -hmm. It was a beach on the ocean somewhere. Yeah. We were, we, our whole platoon came in for a day. We had a steak fryer, burgers on the beach, you know, and you swam, and they had the OD green and life or the old green air mattresses, you know, and we weren't worried about sharks, you know, but uh, just had a day on the on the beach and then went back out again. Okay. Well, there was China <coughs> Beach, which was, uh, or the Eagle Beach was another one that was up there. There were some beaches that were north. Cameron was farther south. Okay, was maybe it was one of those. I don't yeah. remember. Yeah. Somebody mentioned Cameron. I thought, oh, maybe that's what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was a that was a huge base farther south. Right. And there that, was a beach, but then there were a lot of facilities yeah. there. All, yeah, all this was probably up where we were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it would have taken longer to get there. You would have had to fly there yeah. or something. Yeah, no, this was this was just a day trip. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, over the course of the year that you're in Vietnam, uh, was there kind of a, a rhythm or a pattern to it in terms of how much activity there was or how much you were fighting? Um, sometimes weeks would go by. We never shoot our gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were working the villages and that time I told you that the civilian came in walking point before dark, I was on the machine gun and um, Bob Prate, good friend of mine, he was a father and a, and a wife, father and a husband like I was. In fact, he was one of the instant, instant NCOs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he was right next to me and uh, the shit hit the fan and it was about dark and an RPG came in behind me, got him. Mm -hmm. And many times that happened. I don't recall, you know, I recall that because it was a good friend, but it seemed like every time they were aiming for me, they got someone else. And like I said, by the grace of God and lots of prayers, someone else lost their life or went to a, to a hospital to recover, you know? Right. As a machine gunner, were you one of the first targets? That in the radio. Mm -hmm. I can still remember that night. He was next to me and took a shrapnel from an RPG in the back and he's standing up and he's and uh, he's uh, yelling I don't want to die and uh, I grabbed him and pulled him down while I was firing the gun and the guy was feeding the ammo to me the barrel was orange on the gun mm -hmm. I was strafing the area I thought hey I, we got to show them we got a lot more power than they do so they get the crap out of here you know but he he kept saying, I don't want to die. I pulled him down, you know, and by the time we cleared the, cleared the area so we could get a medevac in, he went into shock. Mm -hmm. And we heard a couple of days later he died. And I got a letter from his wife asking how it happened, because all they do is, yeah, he was in such and such a villain, yeah. he got killed in action. And I said to the guys, how do I write this letter? You know, how do I know how I'd act if I was mortally wounded? And would I say the same thing he did? And uh, I just told her how it happened, but I didn't say that he was, he was afraid, mm -hmm. afraid of dying. Um, took me a while to put that letter together. Right. And I never heard from her again. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was pretty tough. Uh, and when I came home, you know, I, you put all that stuff behind you. And you throw your uniform in a closet. You know, you never tell anybody what you did because it was a bad time. Mm -hmm. You go right back to work. They know where you were, but they didn't ask you about it. Right. They, now, they kind of alienated you, even thinking that, hey, you're going to go postal and blow up the place, you know? But. Yeah. Now, uh, while you were there, what kind of understanding did you have of why you were there? Because my country asked me to go. Mm -hmm. Did I agree with the war? No. Did anybody agree with the war? No. Was it really a war? No. 
Did we, did we get to do everything we wanted to do? No. There were times we had to call in before we could fire back. Mm -hmm. They'd be firing at us, we'd have to call in because there was a ceasefire for some reason. There were times we fired back without calling, calling in for um, approval. It wasn't a war. It wasn't fair. You know, we had to go by the rules like most other wars, you know, mm -hmm. Second World War, Korean War, whatever. We have to abide by the rules, but the enemy doesn't. And we have to be the good guys, even though we're in a war defending their country. They're not, they're not here, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it was not good. Okay. Now, was that the kind of thing that would tend to happen when you were in the populated areas? Or were there also rules that were getting, they were trying to enforce even when you were out in the jungle someplace? It depended, because there were ceasefires for different reasons, mm -hmm. like for their holidays or for whatever. Right. If we had a ceasefire for our holiday, it didn't matter. They didn't care. They knew it, but they didn't, or maybe they didn't know it. Mm -hmm. They didn't care. Like I said, we had to abide by the rules, but they didn't. You know, so it could have been anywhere, anywhere, um, anywhere you run into them, mm -hmm. whether it's in a village or out in the jungle or fire bases. We never, never had anybody try to run over on a fire base. We were out on the, I've got pictures that I was going to take, but I didn't, but we were on south, looking down in one of the big bays on the South China Sea, and uh, it was like that. It wasn't brush any taller than three feet tall all the way down. They'd have to sneak up during the night. They wouldn't come during the day, and, and that's normally when they did is everything is at night. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, another, another time, we had friendly fire. I, we were in Fu Lock or somewhere, one of those villages. And we went out too late to set up our ambush, and it was dark. And we were walking down this trail. Actually, one of their streets in their village, basically, a dirt street. You know, and it had hedgerows 10 feet wide. You couldn't get through them. You mm -hmm. know, probably no more than six or eight feet wide. And the Marines came up on us. We didn't know they were there, and we didn't know they didn't know we were there. And all of a sudden, the shit hits the fan, and there's tracers flying everywhere, and, and uh, somebody yells medic, and they realize we were friendly fire. Now, didn't you have tracers that were the same color? Would have been, yeah. Yeah. But I, I don't think, I don't know that they caught that. You know, it, it didn't last long. Probably, right. probably less than 100 rounds went off. Mm -hmm. But the guy right in front of me, Gary Henderson, uh, he took what I would have got. If, if, he would, if he would have hit the dirt before me, I would have got what he got. And he, he took an M16 round in his forearm here and just tore it up. Got another one ricocheted off his M16 into his rib cage. Mm -hmm. He spent 18 months in a VA hospital. And we were trying to find each other's back and we were trying to find anybody we could to have a reunion. And one of the guys that lives in New York went to the wall to see if Gary was on the wall because mm -hmm. we never heard from him. Never knew whether he lived or died. Mm -hmm. That's how communications were there. Yeah. He wasn't on the wall, so we knew he was alive, so we found out he was in Knoxville, Tennessee. So one by one, we got seven of us together. The guy that got us together doesn't come, Kenny Chance. Mm -hmm. he's, he's got a real bad case of PTSD. And, uh, All right, now, um, when it when you got short, when you got close to the end <clears throat> of your tour, did you do anything differently or think any differently? Of course. I'm not volunteering for anything. Mm -hmm. They tell me I got to go, I'll do it. I'm not volunteering for anything. I'm, I'm watching my own backside because I want to go home live, you know? Uh, and I, you know I, I told the kids at high school, I said, I said, I must say, you know, I did what my country asked. I'm no hero. Uh, the guys that are on the wall in D.C. are the heroes. Mm -hmm. And the kids wrote me thank you cards, and they said, you know, you are a hero. You know, you fought for the freedom that we enjoy. And that was in quite a few cards. Mm -hmm. I had a hard time reading them. Yeah. Well, Chris, one of the things is that when, at the time that you were in, it was pretty common for just a lot of ordinary people to wind up in the military and especially yeah. in the army because oh, yeah. it was so big. Yeah. And so a lot of guys of your age went through. But I mean, I grew up with Vietnam on television and you know, oh, I, yeah. that was gone yeah. by the 
time I would have been old enough, but you know, people my age and, and, and younger, you know, less than one percent of us ever even go in the service, and right. so that yeah. already just being in there distinguishes you from a lot of the rest. And the fact is, you went and you did your duty. And for those of us who were younger, we thought about it, we knew about the draft. Well, what will happen when that comes? Uh -huh. So you know, you did do that. There were a lot of guys that, um, in fact, the guy that did the photo shoots for this big read program that I was part of. Um, he had deferments because he was going to college, and when his deferments were done, he got a draft notice. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't want to be on the ground. He didn't want to kill anybody. So he enlisted in the Air Force, and he worked for the Strategic Air Command. He was in Nebraska, I think, where their headquarters mm -hmm. were, looking at charts, laying out bombing missions. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd leave the base during it when his day was over and they'd, there'd be protesters throwing eggs at his car as he left, mm -hmm. yelling baby killer and all that. And You know, he, I've sat and talked with him quite a bit since, since he did the photo shoot and I said, I said, from what you're telling me, you know, and he's never talked to anybody about it till now. I said, I think you have a case of PTSD even though you haven't been there. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, and I probably shouldn't say this to you but the job you had, you're probably responsible for killing more people in Vietnam than I was, which probably didn't help his cause. Mm -hmm. But I got him, <clears throat> got him to make an appointment with a service officer to talk to a service officer and get set up to see a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. you know, just to, to vent. And said, there may be some benefits there for you, you know. Yeah. If they rate you at 30, 40, 50 percent PCSD, I said you're you're gonna you're gonna come off with six, seven hundred dollars a month in in counseling. Mm -hmm. to get your past where you are, even though you're, he's my age, 68. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he, uh, he took an early out of the Air Force if he would have joined the Air Guards. And he, so he got out of the military, and when it, when it came time for him to report to do a, a weekend or a two-week hitch with the Air Guards, he went into the captain or the colonel and said, I can't do this, I can't put the uniform on again. So I can't do it. He was telling me this when we were sitting there, and he said, Colonel said, well, you know, he said, I can court-martial you, put you in jail, I can give you a dishonorable discharge. He said, I don't care, I can't do it. They let him out mm -hmm. with an honorable discharge. Yeah. Let's back up a little bit here. We were talking about uh, the end of your tour. Um, <coughs> when it was time for you to go, how did that play out? I mean, were you in the field right until the end? or mm -hmm. did, Okay. As we call it, we were short. Mm -hmm. We counted the days from the time we got there. Yep. Counted down. And you're really short when you only have a month or a week or three days left. But you get out of the field on a resupply, or maybe if there, were, if it was, if we'd just been resupplied, you know, sometimes you'd be back there four or five days. It depend when the resupply was that you get a ride back to the base camp. But I, from what I remember, I got back to the base camp, did a bunch of paperwork. They took me down to. I don't know if there was an air base on Camp Eagle or Camp Evans? They both had strips, but Eagle so, had probably the bigger one. Yeah, so they had C-130s and they'd mm -hmm. fly you down to Da Nang or somewhere, yeah. or Tonsonute, where you'd mm -hmm. get the, catch the, as we called it, the big bird going home. Right. So from the time I got out of the boonies, did a bunch of paperwork, landed in California, landed in Grand Rapids, and got home, it was probably less than two days. Mm -hmm. uh, right. The only debriefing I got, you know, we're, we're flying we're flying in, I still remember that. We're flying in the pilot on the plane says, I, so I want you to know we're entering US airspace. And the whole plane roared. Mm -hmm. And then someone else said, and I don't know if it was someone that rode back and forth on the plane, someone else said to us, when we land, there's gonna be protesters on the other side of the fence. Just ignore them, don't say anything. And uh, that was our only debriefing mm -hmm. for a year of being a hired paid killer. So there wasn't anything like when you're out <coughs> processing, they didn't do anything else nope. with you at all? Nope. Okay. They wanted us to buy us a steak dinner on the West Coast. And I said, I used a few F words back then, which mm -hmm. I don't say anymore. I said, I don't need that F and steak dinner. I want to get home, you know? Right. And uh, I remember getting off the plane. Most of us kissed the ground. And there were protesters on the other side of the fence yelling at us. They didn't have any eggs, but they were yelling, baby killer, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. I get in the airport, changing flights, and 
in a uniform, you know, you fly standby. Right. Oops, touched the mic, didn't I? Close. Uh, you're in, a, you know, and you're waiting there for your connecting flight, and then you fly standby, and you get a seat if there's planes not full. Mm -hmm. and it's like you're invisible in the airport. Nobody sees you. You're just totally invisible. Unless you're unlucky and somebody comes over and calls you a baby killer and mm -hmm. spits on you, which I didn't have. You know, so I was pretty much invisible. And I asked the kids in class, I said, do you ever feel invisible? You know, like you're not part of anything happening. A couple of kids raised their hand like this. Well, that's what I felt like in the airport. Mm -hmm. So, you know, nowadays, every time we've flown in the last few years, military and first class load first. Mm -hmm. They have a seat on the plane. You know, so our government, nobody gave a shit about us oh. back then. Just our families, you know, and maybe close friends. Did we, the Army we, make any effort to get you to re-up or extend or anything like that? They wanted me to join the guards. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm not playing war games. But, you know, they, when you're in Nam and they ask you, where do you want to spend your last five months stateside? Is it close to home? You okay. know where they put me? Fort Lewis, Washington in Tacoma mm -hmm. in an armor unit. We painted tanks and took them out in maneuvers and wrecked them, towed half of them back in. Had bottles of wine stashed everywhere. If I'd have stayed in the military, I'd have been an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I had a drinking problem coming out. It took me a long time to, to ease off from that. You know, if I would have spent any more time in the military, I'd have turned out an alcoholic. Okay. And the shorter run, <coughs> so you, you get to go home first, and then you, get, you go out to Fort Lewis. Yeah, so we drove, back, we drove back to Fort Lewis, Washington. Had our 11-month-old son that, you know, and flying into Grand Rapids, and I'll back up a little bit, flying mm -hmm. into Grand Rapids, you know, getting off the plane. My whole family was there. Um, brothers, sisters, spouses, there weren't any other grandkids. Our, mm -hmm. our oldest son, our son is the oldest grandchild. Right. He was 11 months old before I saw him, other than pictures. Mm -hmm. They're all standing there at the gate. When you could do that back then, you could stand right yep. by the gate yep. as I came off the plane. I still remember that. I don't remember that they were waving flags or anything, but they were all there. Yeah. You at least got a welcome home. Came back home to my parents' house and they had a big sign up over the driveway, welcome home, Bob. I don't know if it was, if it was painted on a sheet or what it was, but it was huge, you mm -hmm. know, so everybody in the neighborhood knew I was back, but that was probably about the end of it. You know, then mm -hmm. you, you get on with life and throw your uniform in a closet and don't tell anybody and just work, you know? Okay. So did your, uh so did your wife and son stay out in Washington while you were there? Yeah, or? we drove out. Okay. Yeah, we put a we put a seven year crib mattress in the back seat and no seat belts in, you know. Mm -hmm. We had the lap belts. Yep. We didn't wear them. Didn't have to. So his his bed and his playpen was in the back seat of the car. And then uh, drove out there two or three. I, I reported a day late because we didn't allow enough time to get there, mm -hmm. which was okay. And then drive back home again five months later. Yeah. And then were there a lot of guys who were there doing the same thing that you were? They were just kind of finishing out their Some time. Of them. In fact, um, we lived off base. We were making um, $300 a month. Rent was 110. Mm -hmm. So we were living off base, and he had to report in every morning for roll call. Still dark, 5:30, 6 o'clock in the morning. Then you eat breakfast. And I thought this is bullshit. So I paid a guy five bucks or whatever to. Get when they called Prince, hey, you know, it was dark, they couldn't tell. I got caught. They were going to restrict me to brace, base and, bri and bus me to, to E1, mm -hmm. private E1. I told the captain, I was probably standing there in tears, you know, because I got a wife and kid home, off base. I said, you know, this is a bunch of bullshit. I said, the war is almost over. I said, I've got five months to go and you, you put me through this kind of shit. After fighting to stay alive, and you put me through this kind of shit, you could have just let give me an early out. Hey, call me back if you need me. Mm -hmm. And I was standing there telling him all that, and he let me off. He could have busted me to private E1. He didn't. Did you have a sense that he'd been to Vietnam himself? Uh, probably, but mm -hmm. I didn't talk to him about it. Yeah. You know, he's a captain. You're mm -hmm. a spec sure. for you know. You don't associate with those guys because you got to. Every time you see him, you got to salute. Mm -hmm. You know. Nah. No, you didn't. I didn't have any friends that were, all the friends were where we were. Right. Sergeants and down, you know? Mm hmm. 
You know, and like I said, they're all like brothers. Okay. So what did you do once those five months were finished? Went back to the job I had before I left, and a month later I got laid off. Times were slow. Mm -hmm. So then I, my dad was at the time was working for a plumber, and they had two guys quit. He talked to the boss, and I went over there to help out until I found a job and ended up staying on. Mm -hmm. And uh, eight months later, we had the choice of unemployment or self-employment because they were going a different direction. Okay. And that's when my dad and I started a plumbing business back in November of 70. Mm -hmm. And I still do it part-time yet. At almost 68 years old. All right. Now, you say you, you came back and you, you tried to put a lot of the Vietnam and the Army stuff behind you. Uh, how long did it take you to start to talk to people about it? Or I didn't. Okay. Um, I don't remember that I had nightmares or flashbacks right away. I want to think it started 25, 30 years later, mm -hmm. and I just dealt with it. You know, I'd wake up in a cold sweat and and uh, lay back down, go back to sleep. But it got to the point I couldn't take it anymore. So that was probably 10, 12 years ago. So I went. And made an appointment with uh, the shrink in Battle Creek. <laughs> and I told the kids in class, I said, you know, that guy was probably your age. Mm -hmm. Knew everything about Vietnam, he thought. <clears throat> and you know quite a bit, you know, because you've been interviewing all mm -hmm. of us. <clears throat> and he's trying to tell me everything, you know, and I said, how in the hell do you know what Vietnam's like if you lived it, you know? I said, you don't know. But one thing he did say to me in the three hours of interrogating, you know, and there were times I was bawling, three mm -hmm. hours, my wife sat out in the waiting room she went with, and one thing he said to me, he said was, do you ever talk about it? I said, no. Didn't tell my wife, my brothers, my sisters, nobody. At the time, us seven guys weren't getting together. Mm -hmm. I said, nobody knows. Nobody knows what I went through. Not even my wife. Uh, I don't talk about it. He said, well, you know, if you don't talk about it, when you get into a deep sleep, it comes out. He said, you got to talk about it. And he said, I think another thing you're, you're having trouble with is survivor guilt. Because you saw so many guys die that should have been you. You know, so. <laughs> it's, it's better now. But uh, I feel much better now that I've talked about it, mm -hmm. starting at the high school. Right. And I did the same thing in high school a couple times. I told the teacher, I said, I said, I don't know how I'm, said, I don't know how I'm going to react, but I'll do it. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. I got to get it out. When did you start uh, seeing the other guys from your unit again? We just had our 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. We started, in fact, Kenny Chance, the guy that him and I shared the machine gun, man, I wasn't home from Nam. He, t he had my phone number and everything and where I lived. and I wasn't home from Nam more than a year, and he's going to come and see me. Mm -hmm. Of course, he, was, he had a screwed up life. He had already a marriage behind him working on a second marriage that was falling apart. And he uh, he said, if I get a reunion together, will you come? And I said, no. A couple of times he was coming to see me, but mm -hmm. he had a drinking problem, and he came with a friend. Mm -hmm. They got as far as Chicago, turned around, went back home, and he was in southern Iowa. I said, up till 3 in the morning, he doesn't come, you know? Mm -hmm. Three days later, I get a call from him. You know, so he was the guy that, along with Gary Henderson, no, no, because we didn't know Gary was alive. Yeah. It was... Uh, uh, Richard Treese, I think. Between Treese and him, they started putting feelers out and trying to find guys. And uh, one of the guys, Bingham to New York, Mike Fletcher, there were 17 Mike Fletchers in New York. He called every one of them and left a message mm -hmm. on their machine. You know, were you in the, hundred, were you in the first of 327th? And you know, this is Kenny Chance, remember me? He said, give me a call back if you're the right one. Mm -hmm. So one by one, he found seven of us. And in the meantime, Gary Henderson had found Kelly out in California because he had, he had sent her grandmother a letter telling mm -hmm. him who he was. Mm -hmm. And um, grandmother never gave it to Kelly. And grandma died, 
and her and her husband were cleaning out the house, you know, and they were throwing mm -hmm. stuff in the, to take it to the dump, and a letter fell out of a box. And it was a letter that Gary had wrote to her probably eight, ten years earlier. It could have just well went to the dump, and we would have never found her. You know, so she comes, she flies in to every one of our reunions the last ten years, flies in from California with her husband. A couple of times she took a 16-year-old son with, <laughs> and uh, her husband, Mike, we were in Binghamton, New York, at Mike Fletcher's place for our reunion this year. We started out going to Kokomo, mm -hmm. uh, Howard County Vietnam Vets. Yep. Uh, they got an airstrip south of Kokomo, and they converted that into a camp. We went there probably three or four years, and the first year the women were out there with us. We set up a top, you know, and cooked some meals, and <laughs> the women didn't like it, so they went shopping. Mm -hmm. You know, they... Uh, so we thought, hey, let's just do it different. Why don't we start meeting everybody else's houses, you know? Because women don't like it there anyhow. They're staying in town shopping, you know? So that's how we started that. But um, Kokomo, it was uh, Binghamton this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forgot where I was going with that, but anyhow. Well, I was just going to ask you kind of about how that's because you're talking about not telling people stuff. So had you had that first visit with a psychiatrist before you started to see these guys again? Right, yeah. Okay. And that's why I got, and in fact, I was the last of the ten guys, the last of the seven guys to say yes. Mm -hmm. They called me all the time, hey, you know, Kokomo reunions, September 19th, every year, whatever, are you going to come down this year? I said, nope, not coming. Can't do it. Don't want to bring any of that up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that was after I talked to the shrink. It was all pretty much in there. I don't remember right. exactly how it happened, but I finally finally decided, yes, I'm going to go, you know, and you, you haven't seen those guys for almost 40 years. No pictures, nothing. And uh, we all changed quite a bit in 40 years. Mm -hmm. One guy I could not rec recognize, his name is PJ. He's from Kentucky. He had a full beard and he looked like ZZ Top. Looked nothing like he did in Nam. Um, mm -hmm. we, we only knew him as PJ, never knew his name. Yeah. That was the hardest guy to find, from what I understand. And Treese was another guy. That was his last name. We never knew what his first name was. Didn't know where he was from. So we all get together and joke around. The women, the women have gotten to be pretty close friends too, you know, just because mm -hmm. of us. But uh, how does your wife manage to make it through all of this? It was tough. Um, you know, I've got three grown sons. 47, 44, and 36. And I was oldest of seven, you know, so I was expected to toe the line, you mm -hmm. know, at home. I had a father that was probably a type A like I was. I'm not anymore. But my kids four or five years ago more than once told me, I said, you know what, Dad? He said, we could never measure up to what you expected from us, which made me feel bad, you know? <laughs> I didn't mean to be that way, but it was part of part of my growing up, I guess, and part of the military combined mm -hmm. that just made me that way. You know, I'd, I'd come home from work, you know, and and uh, it's either Brian or Kurt. Brian's the oldest. Kurt's second. Derek's the third. He had mowed the grass during the day. He said, "Hey, Dad, I'm mowing." He comes up to the truck, running up to me. He comes up to the truck. Hey, Dad, I mowed the grass today. And I said, "Yeah." And there's a two-foot strip over there, this wide, that you missed. Mm -hmm. That's the way it was. Um, you talked a little bit about sort of some of the baggage that you, you took with you out of the military. Do you think you got anything positive out of the experience? I learned respect. And I really think everyone should spend three to six months in the military just to learn respect of country. Mm -hmm. You know, some kind of military duty. Because there are so many kids around, around here nowadays that don't have any respect for anything. They've got their hand out like this, dad and mom throw money in their hand and it makes it even worse, you know? Um, I learned a lot of respect being in the military. Um, and you know, I'm backing up to how'd your wife deal with it, I didn't even mention that. You know, there's, she's pretty tough. But there were four or five times in our marriage that I didn't realize what an asshole I was and she was packing her bags to leave. Mm -hmm. I'm, one, I'm the guy that vents all the time. She keeps it in until she blows. Mm -hmm. And then when she's blowing, she's packing her bag to leave. So four or five times, could have fallen apart. 
but uh, we're still together almost 48 mm -hmm. years. It's much better now that I've vented, get it out, you know. Well, it's certainly a story worth telling. So I'd just like to close out here by thanking you for taking the time to come in and share the story today. Yeah, thank you. All right.